All right, thank you. Um, I really thank Sam. I mean, he, like the questions, this is exactly the perfect setup for this. Um, this is ongoing work, I mean, not ongoing, I mean, it's gonna be presented at CCS, it's on ePrint, it's exactly to tackle some of the problems or, or the issues that were brought up. And all the points that he pointed out clearly has a lot of experience actually digging deeper into these uh, protocols and implementing them. Um, I claim that hopefully what you get out of this talk that you will be forced to do these things if you use an interactive theorem prover or computer-aided verification for your protocols. All right, so what this talk is not about, there are no new protocols, no hardness assumptions, or I'm not also talking about UC yet. Um, we're doing game-based uh, verification, sort of modeling also. And we're also, not, what I'm not talking about, having the computer find the protocol or a proof for you. This is basically, if you have a specific protocol and a proof for it, and you wanna get high confidence in it, and also what I wanna, hopefully you get out of this talk, is that if you've been through the trouble of actually verifying it in a formal uh, model, I'm like a theorem prover, you have to do a little bit of work and you will get an executable out of it that is correctly constructed. Okay, um, just a obligatory slide on MPC, protocol that allows a bunch of mistrusting parties, typically software, to compute a function under private input, historically, semi-honest, passive, honest but curious, the model that cares more about privacy, and the active one or the malicious one is where you basically can have cheating and arbitrary deviation from the protocol. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, I mean, this crowd doesn't need it, but the reason why I just want, if anybody doesn't know sh secret sharing is you have the share and reconstruct protocol is because I wanna show you actually formalizing it in EasyCrypt and show you, well, I want you to walk away to basically the message is that this is possible. Like MPC, I consider it as uh, an advanced cryptographic uh, protocol and primitive and it's not that straightforward to implement, especially once you get to the malicious and active setting and also adaptive adversaries. One more thing I'm gonna talk about is, okay, over a long period of time, um, if you have things that are secret shared, then mobile adversary can basically collect all shares. This has been uh, handled in the literature before in the proactive setting where you basically are going to move, sort of you're, you're, you're moving the polynomials that you're sharing with over time so that somebody that is trying to compromise and get all the shares, over time you're resetting parties and starting them from scratch, they need to recover their shares from the existing polynomials so you cannot stitch things together. And this is very basic. I just want um, you to be aware of this because I will show you formalism that actually implements this stuff. Sorry. Um, all right. Okay, so the reason why I'm saying MPC starts to become uh, much more complex is once you start to worry about dynamic groups and things like proactive security, very quickly you find that your MPC protocol has um, seven, eight, or nine sub-protocols. And uh, that's why you see and composability is very important, but that's at the protocol design. What about the software? This is non-trivial. So um, just uh, when you refresh shares, the standard trick is if you basically had multiple shares on um, a polynomial, everybody gets the evaluation of the polynomial, so a simple way to refresh it is, ba uh, sorry, to refresh is generate a polynomial that evaluates to zeros, that's the green one, add where the secrets are, share it again, everybody deletes their, own sh their old shares, so basically what you get is a new sharing uh, of the same secret. When you recover share is basically when a party leaves the protocol and comes up again, you need to give it, doesn't have any state, you need to give it existing shares. So uh, this is very basic. MPC has been known since 88. BGW is one of the most fundamental protocol. This is an interesting fact. There was no fully specified proof till 2011. And once you get, and I, I highly, I mean, this is very appreciated, the, the work that Asharov and Lindell go through to specify everything in detail and have a full proof, um, that's a long time, okay? And when you look at that paper, that's like an 87 page paper. 84 pages of it is about um, passive and uh, static, um, static active. When you start to get into adaptive uh, malicious adversaries and also composability, there's a lot of other papers that you need to refer to and theorems. This is highly non-trivial. So actually even implementing something for adaptive active adversaries, I, I don't know if, if anybody did it, but it's whatever happened is non-trivial. 
Um, so basically, why worry about verifying MPC? Because one, it provides an existing proof that you can tackle in computer verification complex protocols. And then people now are talking about zero knowledge, homomorphic encryption. I think we're ready to actually verify these in uh, interactive theorem provers. Um, they're becoming increasingly relevant in blockchain settings. And not only that, honestly, if you were at the talk yesterday, the blockchain, Dalia Malki mentioned this protocol. This is a consensus protocol, Ziziva, that was uh, written in 2007. And 10 years later, they found that the liveness and safety conditions were violated in very simple scenarios. 10 years to do that. And this is something that doesn't even worry about confidentiality and privacy of inputs. MPC is way more complicated. So I'm not saying that the MPC protocols have issues in them. I'm saying this is like higher confidence, a level of confidence that's just not there yet. And if we, if we go there, to build infrastructure that should last for decades, I think this is the best way to go to get that level of confidence. All right, um, there's already been some workshops and people talking, there's some funding programs about, so there is interest in the community of sort of merging cryptography and the PL community and get formal verification. It's just that so far, they talk, I've been to that workshop, it was very useful, uh, different languages and it's, it's unclear how soon we can sort of, sort of merge both and hopefully this work provides evidence that it's gonna happen soon and people can build on it. All right, so my opinion is that, and just gonna mention it here, and this is the end of the fluffy stuff, it's all gonna be more technical from now, is that when you talk about formal verification, don't only talk about the specification of the protocol, might as well get executable software that is correctly constructed because what, you, what I learned in the last year going through that exercise is that you're almost 80% of the way through when you use one of the theorem provers to actually formalize any protocol. All right, so easy crypt in a nutshell, if you haven't heard about it, it's an interactive theorem prover that basically allows you, it has a probabilistic language that allows you to describe a lot of the primitives and the constructions we use in papers so that you can sample from random distribution, can be hooked to interactive theorem prover and SMT, uh, this is satisfiable modulo theory solvers, to automate the proofs. Um, this is following the construction of it, the architecture is following some work from Bellari that basically is proposing to verify crypto protocol as code-based sort of objects. Um, Typically, you would describe a construction or a protocol as a module, some, some global variables and procedures and definitions, and then there's multiple levels at which you would verify something like this. Um, so for instance, like take El Gamal, a textbook El Gamal. I mean, if you write an easy crypt, as you would write it in your paper, you have three, uh, three uh, procedures, uh, algorithms, key generation, encrypt, and decrypt, um, and they have already operators to sample randomly from um, let's say a group of a specific order. So this is not far away from how you would write in tech your, your protocol. So what I'm advocating is if you write this first and then extract from it tech, which is actually possible, um, I think that's the right way to do it. So what we did in this paper, which we presented at CCS, is we did the following. We defined abstract definition for a lot of the primitives that you would have in MPC, not OT. I mean, I think that should be done, but what we did is we did secret sharing, a lot of variations of secret sharing, your standard Shamir one based on polynomial, additive, gradual. Uh, we did MPC, an abstract definition, and then we proved some compositions theorem at that abstract level. Then basically what you do is for each abstract primitive, you need to have a, a um, instantiation of it, which is like in Shamir's case, basically you select a polynomial of a specific degree over a field, and then you prove equivalence of the abstract definition and the actual instantiation of the primitive. And then basically you would um, prove security, this equivalence, you can extract from the specification. You have a security game also, and then you basically um, prove, you have to specify the proof in EasyCrypt. And I'll show you examples of this. It's not gonna stay that high level. It's just I want you to walk away with the overall sort of mental map of what happens. Um, so we have game-based security definition for each of the primitives. We code the actual proofs and verify them in EasyCrypt. But that's only half the story, or like two-thirds of the story. The interesting thing that we observed is the language of EasyCrypt is very close to a language called YML, which you can automatically extract from it OCaml, which is executable in a verified way. Exactly the question that was raised um, before, before I walked on the stage 
I think this is possible, and I think this is how things should be done, because expecting software developers to learn cryptography, it's just not going to happen. Um, the cryptographers also are not going to write the code. So it's much easier if the protocol designer uses a tool like this, and then you get the whole thing automated, and again, in a verifiable way. All right, so this is not happening in vacuum. I mean, in the last several years, there have been a lot of interesting efforts sort of slowly making progress towards this. But till this paper, nobody has verified a generic MPC protocol for end parties for the active setting, active adversaries, and had the whole proof in EasyCrypt, and also nobody had extracted software from that proof uh, specification or that formalism that is actually executable. And that's what we have in, in our paper. Um, previous work has looked at like uh, the um, SV17 private count retrieval. That's a protocol for three parties that is basically counting the number of records that match a certain query in a database. And they only did it for the passive uh, model. Um, in CCS17, um, they did it for Yao, um, two-party computation, garbled circuits, but also only for passive. And they did extract executable software. And then uh, finally, in 18, uh, HK Plus, they, they did it for a protocol by Uli Maurer that's very simple. The beauty of that protocol is it's not only for threshold adversary structures, for general adversary structures. But there's a catch here that the protocol, they didn't have the whole proof actually formalized in EasyCrypt. If you read the paper carefully, you find that they did um, at some point prove that the protocol satisfies some properties, and then they have a manual step where they say, oh, if these properties are satisfied in a protocol, then you have a simulator. But it was never really uh, coded in EasyCrypt. I think it's doable, they just didn't. And they also didn't bother uh, extracting executable software from the formalism in EasyCrypt. Um, so, okay, so I've been talking now about these abstract definitions. So this would be, for instance, an example of an abstract definition of secret sharing, okay? Um, the same way you would define it in a paper, right? When you start uh, writing about, let's say, I'm going to use secret sharing. You define, you have a definition that says secret sharing, which is essentially what matters is what's in the red box. There are two algorithms, share and reconstruct takes and inputs some randomness, a secret, and outputs some shares. And the reconstruct takes the shares and outputs some, um, I mean, all, all this code is in the paper, and we have it on, also on GitHub. So I mean, um, the link, I'm happy to turn it. I see people taking pictures. Um, it's all open source. So basically, this is, you're not really specifying how you're going to share or reconstruct. So you do this once. The, the good thing about this working at the abstract level is you do it once. And then later on, every time you instantiate it using a different, I don't know, mathematical structure, I mean, uh, you can do uh, additive sharing or, or using polynomials, it doesn't matter. It still will satisfy these two conditions. Um, sorry, I mean, these two definitions. Then you can also do it, I mean, we did it. All this code is there for um, verifiable secret sharing. Now, similar the way you would uh, implement in C++ or any other object-oriented language where you inherit a class and then overload, for instance, some of the members, we're doing here the same thing. Now, the, the share and reconstruct operations are a little bit more involved because it's verifiable. And you can do the same thing for, um, this, is now, not, this is not the abstract definition anymore. Now that we have the abstract definition, this is the concrete implementation of secret sharing that's following Shamir. Basically, what this map says is basically saying you, you take some randomness and a secret of type secret T, which you define up there, and then you evaluate a polynomial um, using that secret as the, the free term. And the randomness, I mean, if you were here on the talk before, um, I think it was, uh, who was it? Uh, it was talking about the IETF standardization process, the BLS signatures. At some point he said, you might make the, the sampling of the, the, the keys, I think, make it deterministic and pass it a random uh, randomness. And don't verify, I mean, don't, don't sort of explicitly say how that randomness should be chosen. This issue actually, we encountered it when we're trying to formalize this. We realized that it's easier to pass the randomness as sort of like the polynomial. Typically when you write a secret sharing sort of like on paper or so, you, you say, okay, I'm going to select random coefficients and then put the secret in the free term, and that determines the polynomial. Here, what I'm saying is the randomness you're going to pass me is going to be a random polynomial with a zero free term, and I'm then adding to it the actual secret so that it's in the free term, and then share it. What I've found is when you try to formalize things, 
there are multiple ways to do, to do uh, the formalism, and each one can make your life later on easier or harder. There's no right answer. It's really up to your experience and your, your taste. So um, we have the same thing, for instance, this would be additive secret sharing, a concrete implementation of it that satisfies that abstract definition. And then we have the same thing, like commitment scheme, Peterson and Feldman. And then what we have in the paper is um, at the abstract level, we're, we're proving that if you combine a primitive that satisfies the honest but curious definition for uh, basically uh, that the shares are uh, independent of the secret, um, and then with a uh, commitment scheme, then you get for viable secret share. Again, this is proven at the abstract level. And this framework, basically, any time you instantiate any of these primitives using a concrete uh, mathematical structure, that protocol will inherit the composition proofs that you did at the abstract level. Um, so, so that's actually very useful because the, these compositions you prove once. I mean, this is not UC composition. This is composition in series. So we did the same thing for MPC, just this is an abstract definition of what could be an MPC protocol. I mean, again, this is very high level. It's like you have inputs, you have players, you have IDs of players, you have phases, you have an output phase. It doesn't say anything. I and mean, we think of this as sort of the ideal functionality. Um, but then you have to instantiate this actually using concrete protocols. And, and we have also, because we're initially when we started, we're very ambitious. We wanted to actually do a proactive protocol for dynamic groups and dishonest majority. That didn't happen. We settled for just honest majority and proactive, but no dynamic groups yet. Um, so we have some, some uh, composition theorems on, in the proactive setting that are formalized at the abstract level. All right. Um, this, for instance, would be uh, the recover protocol that I tried briefly to describe earlier in using just curves for MPC when you have proactive MPC, when you have basically um, a party that has been reset and it's trying to join the MPC again and it needs to get a, uh, the shares. Uh, how do you give it the shares? What I showed you before that every party would generate a random polynomial with zero at that uh, index of that share. This, this basically is the protocol how you'd implement it in EasyCrypt. All right. So, so far, I'm talking only about abstract definitions and concrete instantiations. Then there's the proof. How does the proof in uh, EasyCrypt look like? Well, I mean, the proof script will basically be a bunch of definitions at the beginning. You're importing the modules, the abstract definitions you want to satisfy, and the concrete instantiations. And then you're defining the type of the adversary. We're defining here an oracle, because in the security game, you have to allow the adversary to query the share uh, functionality with any secrets that it wants. And the game that you uh, the security game that you have is basically similar to how you would define security of an encryption scheme, is um, come up with two messages and then encrypt them and you should distinguish. We're doing the same thing here for the semi-honest model with secret sharing. It just doesn't fit here, so this is how it looks like basically. You generate two secrets, or it could be two lists of secrets. Uh, you, sh you have the adversary choose one, uh, flip a bit. You send them the shares of one of them. The adversary can then query an oracle on sharing on any, any secret they want to get the shares for. And at the end, um, they should have uh, guess a bit. And you basically, in EasyCrypt, because you can compare two uh, probabilistic distributions, you compare if the two bits are um, similarly distributed or not. I mean, depending on if you want to have a statistical uh, least secure or a perfect security or co computational, you can do all this in EasyCrypt. So we've done all of this for, this is the list of primitives and proofs we had. So there's like 30 files with, with a lot of definitions in the semi-honest and the malicious uh, use cases. All right, so as I said, this is only half the story, that you basically uh, wrote the abstract definitions and the concrete instantiations in EasyCrypt, and you wrote the proofs and verified them. The interesting thing is that we found that the EasyCrypt language is very similar to YML. And I think this is not an accident. I think YML is a, a framework used for deductive verification. And I think the EasyCrypt people, when they developed it, they were inspired by or affected by that language. So it turns out that you can actually easily translate from EasyCrypt to YML. And then if, if, I don't know if you've heard about OCaml or not before, it's a language that's been around for a while. It's very heavily used in the, uh, the verification and PL community, and it's really um, designed for safety. So what we basically did is we wrote a small tool that translates from an EasyCrypt specification of a protocol to a YML 
specification of that protocol. And then once you're in YML, you have the, all the power of the Y3 framework. There's a lot of tools that can verify YML code and that can also extract code from YML to other languages. So there's already work that extracts uh, OCaml. That the tool is verified, like a verified tool that would translate YML to OCaml, and OCaml is already executable. There's also some tools online that claim to translate from YML to C. I haven't tried, I mean, we tried them, but they didn't work. They're also not claimed to be verified. PVS is the proof verification system, which is the interactive theorem prover of SRI. It's been around for 20 years. Um, the language in PVS is very close to YML, so you can easily translate from YML. We haven't done it yet, to PVS. And my colleagues have a PVS 2C translator. So, so I think it's, it's very plausible that in the next year or so, somebody can write a tool that translates from YML to C, and, or like we will maybe do it from PVS, and then you can get a C implementation. So now the interesting thing when we did this, oh, this is just showing you how closely similar, I mean, like the languages are. So on the right here would be the EasyCrypt, uh, I mean, part of the EasyCrypt code for additive gradual sharing, sorry. Gradual sharing is basically you take a secret, you share it additively, and then take each of the summons, the additive share, and share it using Shamir sharing. Um, the reason why we use that is because it's used in some protocols for mixed adversaries that basically, if you were at the talk yesterday from Dahlia, you can have these um, trade-offs between how many passive party, how many parties are corrupted passively and actively and it's sort of a dial. So in, you look at the protocols that do this, they use the no notion of gradual sharing with a different um, polynomial, increasing degree of polynomials for the different shares, uh, the additive shares. So on the left, this is the EasyCrypt code for a gradual sharing scheme, and on the middle, that's the YML code, and on the right, the OCaml code. They're very similar, if, if, you, I mean, if you can see sort of a bunch of variables, and then let, for instance, here you're defining in YML, a function when you say let, very similar to EasyCrypt. In OCaml, it's a little bit different. So I mean, basically, I, mean, I want to show you that languages are not far, and that's why we have verified tools to translate from each to the other. So then the, the question is, that code that you extract, which is executable, how bad is the performance? Um, so I think it's a little bit unfair to expect that you would compare this against sort of an optimized tool. So what we do is we take Charm, which is a Python-based framework, and we imp it has its own secret sharing class. So we compare against what's there um, for different field sizes, different number of parties, and it's not that bad. I mean, it, listen, it, this is something that you get within a minute once you write uh, things in EasyCrypt. Um, people spend months and years optimizing uh, implementation. So, um, I think it's, it's, it's premature to say we expect the same level of, of performance. But there's nothing that precludes us from also implementing a lot of the optimizations that people do in EasyCrypt and getting similar performance. So in some of the cases, actually, one thing I'm going to point out is um, when you look at Charm, sharing and reconstructing, um, and then our extracted code. So it, reconstructing in Charm for 15 parties, sorry, there's a, um, the second row in extracted that should be 15, 15 parties. It takes two milliseconds to reconstruct. It took us six milliseconds, and to share 23 and one and a half. The reason why we're faster in sharing and not reconstructing is because we actually needed to implement in EasyCrypt a library for evaluating polynomials and doing the interpolation, and that's what we're actually synthesizing in OCaml, and that's what we're using for interpolating. If you take that part out and let's say replace it by NTL, a C-based implementation for has a lot of uh, algorithms that you would need, it would be much faster. The point is that NTL is not verified, whereas the OCaml code here is, is formally verified because the tool is formally verified that extracts it. So, so this area, there's a lot of research to be done here on optimizing. Um, I think there is hope. I mean, in the next five years, even if you have, I think, 20%, 30% overhead, it might be worth it for the increased confidence you have in the correctness of the software. Um, Anyway, what's missing, what we haven't done, and yeah, we're working on some of this, but uh, please, if, if you're interested in this area, I'd be glad to see people working on it, is adaptive active adversaries, UC, uh, verifying the underlying broadcast protocol, for instance. Nobody has done this before. Um, the underlying implementations of fields, groups, and all these things, nobody has done a verified implementation of this, as far as I know. 
recently there's been some project like Project Everest or Evercrypt using this as the underlying uh, primitives for an uh, extracted MPC code would be, would be an interesting uh, avenue. Nobody has done this before. Um, comparing against sort of more optimized protocols and implementations, um, I think if, if you start to look now at optimizing what we have implemented in EasyCrypt, um, we might, that would be a fair comparison, but, but so far it was really, all, the basic stuff just wasn't there. So I mean, it took us a lot of time to implement the very basic libraries and building blocks. And then uh, translating to C, uh, OCaml's performance is not bad, I personally think. I mean, you're not gonna get much more out of C, but the memory footprint of OCaml is bad because OCaml doesn't release memory. So um, it's not gonna scale at some point. So th th there is need to also work in C. Um, I think. Anyway, and obviously the future work is basically addressing these things. And um, there are other interactive theorem provers other than EasyCrypt. EasyCrypt is really focused for cryptography. So like things like Coq, Isabel, and PVS. If you now want to start also reasoning about like this MPC software, it's going to be sitting either in a virtual machine or like um, a container or something like that. I mean, if you people are starting to talk about, I mean, not starting, it's been around for a while. Verified microkernel, if you've ever heard of SEL4. I mean, ultimately, what you want to verify everything end to end. Then, so SEL4, for instance, is verified in Isabel. If you want to verify the composition of both of those two things, you need to do the work we've done, like in EasyCrypt, in Isabel. And it's, in principle, doable. It's, it just takes, it was going to take a lot of effort, um, which is good. I mean, there's a lot of research um, to be done. Anyway, whenever I talk to people about this kind of work and this, sort of approach, these are the questions I, or objections I often get. And I just want to put it out there because honestly, I don't think these are valid objections. I was like, oh, what if your security definition or abstract definition of implementation is wrong? I mean, you have the same issue with papers. There is nothing different. I just took it and implemented it just a little bit more rigorous formalism. Uh, what if um, the computer check proof has a problem? It's exactly the same as you have it in a paper. You can always, if you find the bug, if it's nothing fundamental, you can fix it. And within a couple of minutes of worst case hours, you verify the whole pipeline. Uh, what if there's a bug in the verification or synthesis tool chain, EasyCrypt? I mean, EasyCrypt is a big uh, computer, uh, trusted computer base that you're, sorry, trusted code base that you're trusting, fair enough. But EasyCrypt has been around for 10 years. A lot of people are using it. Eventually, I think bugs will be discovered. And if you really want to go there, you can, the same way you, in a programming language, when you design a new programming language, or the first ones, you bootstrap a compiler, you can do the same thing. Like, I can imagine a verified interactive theorem prover like EasyCrypt, that is, you start with a very small kernel that you have enough confidence in it manually, and you bootstrap things, and that's how people did uh, things with compilers. Um, and what if the use tool, I've had that discussion, actually, I just added this, today because I had a uh, discussion in the morning. What if I spend, if I'm a student, I spend six months, nine months learning EasyCrypt and that goes away after two years? I mean, first of all, I am not involved at all in EasyCrypt. I am not, uh, I have zero interest in EasyCrypt, but I think they did a great job and it has matured a lot over the last 10 years. I think anybody, if you told anybody 10 years ago, oh, I'm gonna ver verify something like BGW for active adversaries with a computer, they probably would have dismissed it. We've done it, okay? Um, there's no reason not to take this approach moving forward because as things get more complicated and more automated, uh, we, need, we need that level of rigor. It takes time, yes, but it's worth it. And also, if, in my experience, same thing with programming languages. The first one you learn will take you longer. But then once you've learned it, the second and the third one will be much, much quicker. If you learn one of the theorem provers um, and sort of use it as an extra verification step in your work, um, if, if for some reason you need to switch to another one, it's not going to be that much time to learn and pick up the other one. And if you're a student that's starting and expecting to have a 30, 40 year career in design in, as a cryptographer, I think it's worth it because um, you might not use it on every paper, but every once in a while you need that. Anyway, I'll leave you hopefully with these conclusions. That one, computer-aided verification and automated verified synthesis of software for cryptographic protocols, complex ones, is achievable today. Um, and I think they go hand in hand. I mean, verification by itself is important, but 
if you've done 85% of the work, why don't you just do that extra part? And um, it's reasonably low performance now, to, given that it's automatically synthesized code and that is you have a much higher degree of confidence in its correctness. And there's a lot more research to be done. Um, and yeah, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I hope, uh, I hope that this is something I expose you to something new today. Thank you. A uh, couple quick things. Um, I might have misunderstood, but um, I think maybe on slide 49 or 50, you said something about um, there's no formally verified uh, field arithmetic implementations. Like this. I, I didn't say, I, I said oh. we didn't use one. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. No, no, I, I didn't say there is I was going no, to say, no, no. because there's, certainly there's a bunch sure, of related sure. work no, on Sure, sure, no, I okay. said in our work, we, no, no. Okay, I misunderstood. I know there is, Thank it's you. just. No, I was just trying to, okay. Yeah. The actual question I have is this. Um, in a lot of these, uh, it seems like I, I've been following this work and related work um, because it's extremely interesting. Um, it seems like there's, on the one hand, getting correct by construction software is excellent. On the other hand, like one of the reasons um, when we implement something in C, for example, one of the reasons that we do that is not just because we want it to be fast, but because in some sense, like, maybe the compiler gets out of the way a little more than the OCaml compiler does, which, I mean, kind of sounds like a joke, because of course you always fight the C compiler when you try to write code in it. But uh, specifically, um, like if I'm trying to write constant time code, I have basically no prayer, as far as I can tell, of doing that in OCaml. I could probably get that done, or at least, you know, if I know what compiler I'm targeting, I could probably get that done in C. So it seems like maybe there's a little gap, right, between, on the one hand, correct software, but it's in OCaml, and on the other hand, what I maybe want is really, like, software in C that's constant time, and maybe I can examine the, the you know, internet, the IR or the assembly afterwards. How do you see, how, how will we close that gap? Fair enough. Are you worried because of leakage, resilience, and, and constant time? Uh, for example, yeah. yes. Um, I, I think if you want to do that, I don't think EasyCrypt in its current format has to do that. I think you would need to move to something like COG or Isabel. And I mean, I'm not very familiar with that that area of research. Um, but some of my colleagues actually have been working on uh, sort of these constant time implementations. I, I don't have an answer. I haven't looked at it. I, I don't think there is. Um, it will require a lot of work. It would require probably, like I can imagine it. As I said, if you move to PVS, which is very close to YML, you can extract C from it. And PVS is based on higher order log. It's very generic. You can start reasoning about these constant time. It's just nobody has done it yet. I see. I, okay. Thank you, you know, very much. I, I'll tell you what. We did, honestly, we did OCaml because at some point it was just two of us. And it's a lot of work. No, and we no, this, needed this to go No, this is excellent. It's, it's great. Yeah. It's just like, of course, as you said, there's, there's tons more work to do. And I, I'm, I'm worried about one thing. I'm sure everyone else is worried about, you know, 10 other things. But yeah. So. This is a good answer. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Small comment on the question just now. So, I mean, you mentioned Evercrypt. I mean, one of their motivations is to get uh, the software down, all the way down. There's a team in Taiwan uh, verifying the assembly level. So there is other works in high assurance cryptographic engineering. So it just has to interface somehow. Question to you. Um, you implemented a whole bunch of Shamir things, and I see like sharing and resharing and, well, reconstruction. But is your protocol taking into account that you don't actually have to reconstruct it? I mean, do you have, for instance, a Diffie Hellman where you never uh, recon uh, reconstruct the share, but you just apply it using the shares? I'm, I'm sorry. So, 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 I mean, like when you uh, when you do secret sharing and you want to run Diffie Hellman, okay, you don't have to recover the secret. You yeah. can just apply the, the sh yeah. We don't, the, the recovering is. I mean, you, it's up to you when you want to recover. I mean, we're composing these. I mean, you can just share and just, op are you asking, I mean. But I mean, do you have the functionality to do Diffie Hellman without ever reconstructing? We, we don't, we haven't implemented anything in Diffie Hellman. I think other people implemented Diffie Hellman. Because I mean, that's, that's what would really interest me because I mean, once you have recovered the share, it's gone. I mean, if, if your malicious um, member gets the, sh the combined share or you assume that the combination takes place somewhere else, I mean, in your model, are you assuming... So where, where we're doing MPC, so where take everyone would, be, would mm -hmm. share their inputs, mm -hmm. and you're computing a circuit as additions and multiplications. Mm -hmm. You can leave the, the result sh secret shared without reconstructing. Mm -hmm. So you can leave it without okay. reconstructing. I mean, 
So you, when you say reconstruct, you're reconstructing the result of the computation. Yes, yes. You're not saying you're reconstructing the Shamir secret. No, 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 no. Okay, that, no, that sorry. Was, yes, reconstructing that was my the question. result of the computation. Okay, cool. Yes. Then, then I'm happy.